using my utmost for his highest is always a challenge because it directs us to examine ourselves, to think about what we are as human beings and people and who he is as far as being the ultimate supreme God in our life. It's humbling. It's challenging. It can be sometimes one of the hardest things you may ever do in your life to follow Jesus in a way that maybe others aren't trying or even want to and you may not be able to explain to them why you want to go farther or go on with God while others may be content to just have a little bit to sit in a pew, relax, take it easy, enjoy the good life. Maybe you are thinking that at this time and maybe some of your own personal failures in some way has caused you to re-examine this commitment that you made to God, this desire that you felt that you had when you said, oh, I want all of you or none of you. I want my utmost to be you know, given to you, God, to serve you all the days of your life. And then suddenly you discovered, wow, this isn't easy. This is tough. And you failed in some little step. Or maybe you failed in a big way. Because I know what it's like to want something and then really reach out to go after it and then completely fall flat on your face. Or you suddenly think, oh, I can't do anything because I've already blown it. Then they're done that. You see, there are people that sometimes will tell you, Oh, God can't use you because you're not good enough. God can't use you in some capacity because you're not holy. Or since you already have been a Christian, you've already been forgiven. And now that you've blown it, I'm sorry. You can never be whatever you wanted to be again. Some people are like that. They set standards that no one can meet, even themselves. Because... It's not so much the question of whether you will fail. You will. There's no doubt about it. When you set a standard so high that you're always reaching for it, that you can't attain to it, then you're always going to be after it, not achieving it. You see? You're always reaching, yearning. It's kind of like what the old Jewish songs used to sound like. They had that longing quality in them. You know, if I forget the old Jerusalem, let my right hand lose its cunning, let my tongue cleave to its mouth, if I prefer thee not above my chiefest joy. A yearning. But you see, when Israel moved into the land, as it has in modern days, they turned their back on God. Even today, Israel isn't holy, it isn't righteous. Matter of fact, it's probably very, very atheistic and very humanistic in the worst kind of ways. I mean, talk about gay parades and you know just all the things that you know we hate in America. You can see it pretty easily in Israel. You know, it's it's there too. You know, <laughs> sorry to say, you know, even corruption and graft and all the other things that go on. You know, prostitution and you know things that you think that you know don't happen in the quote holy land. Uh, yes, they do. Once you live there, you know better. But the point is. When you're seeking after God and you have this high ideal, it's okay to want that and to go after that, and it's okay to fail as long as you know what to do with that. Because God wants you to be that way. He wants you to seek Him in such a way that you yearn for Him as though it were the utmost of your being. And even when you fail and miserably, you're still willing to say, Wow and keep trying and keep going to get up off the ground to kind of evaluate your life and say what did I do in error or was there something I could have done differently because in a lot of ways most of the time you're going to find there isn't a thing you could have done you were meant to fail you see growing in the Lord is a process of not achieving the goal but learning to walk with God in your failures and your successes. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. You know my thoughts from afar off.
The way of Abraham in faith. He went out not knowing whither he went. In the Old Testament, personal relationship with God showed itself in separation. And this is symbolized in the life of Abraham by his separation from his country and from his kith and kin. He left over the Chaldees. Today the separation is more of a mental and moral separation from the way those who are dearest to us look at things. You know, you look at things a little differently than maybe some of your family does. That is, they have not a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus is religious. He's an idea, not a person, or even a person that can be known or have a personal relationship with. He's the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus you come to know. Faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading it. It is a life of faith, not of intellect and reason. I see a lot of people sometimes sit down and try to argue and debate with intellect and reason somebody that disagrees with them. And the life of faith has nothing to do with arguing and debating. Faith means you do what you're told because you know who you believe in. I know whom I have trusted and he is able to perform that which concerns me. So lots of times some of the things that you may be doing in your walk with God, your relationship with Jesus, makes no sense at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it looks like one of the most stupid things you could ever do. And maybe it is. But you know in your way of experience with God that he's teaching you something and you're learning something along the way that that process of learning may have been by going through something that seems to be really stupid. But in the long run, for you, produces a great wealth of achievement by how much wisdom you learned and accrued in it. The root of faith is the knowledge of a person, and one of the biggest snares is the idea that God is sure to lead us to success. No, he's not. God doesn't close one door and open another. If he closes one door, he may tell you to stay closed and stand there. That's where people make this big misappropriation of ideas they have about scriptures and try to make them into cute little live-by posters. You know, the, the inspirational thoughts and quotes. Well, inspiration comes from the scriptures, not from interpreting them and trying to make them apply. God doesn't close one door and open another, or God doesn't take something away and give you something better. Those are false statements. They're not true. They're not in the Bible. They're not from the Bible. There's something somebody made up at some point in time based on some scripture they read. And then people ran with it. They said, oh, well, you know, let's make it easy for them to understand and so much simpler than what God said. But let's quote what man said. <laughs> and so you see, sometimes you're going to wind up falling flat on your face because you followed what man said instead of what God said. The final stage in the life of faith is attainment of character. There are many passing transfigurations of character. When we pray, we feel the blessings of God enwrapping us, and for the time being, we are changed at that moment. Then we get back to the ordinary days and ways, and the glory seems to vanish. When we were there in church, it felt so wonderful. We felt like as though we could do no wrong, and we walked out the door and got in a fight an argument, a debate, somewhere where we felt as though we weren't quite the saint we thought we were. Is that you? Have you ever done that? you ever kind of like all excited about what you thought you were going to do and you had it all planned out and you everything was going great and then all of a sudden you walk out the door and you opened your mouth and blew it. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But what you do with that is what determines whether or not you're growing in character. Because you see, becoming poor in spirit means that we have to fail in order to be humble so that we can ask forgiveness and help from others and mercy. We develop character through our failures. And as we grow in those, we make less mistakes 
but we choose a better way to prevent us from falling into those trials and tribulations that maybe caused us to fall in the first place. The life of faith is not a life of mounting up with wings, but a life of walking and not fainting. It is not a question of sanctification, but of something infinitely further on than sanctification. It is a faith that has been tried and proven and stood the test. Abraham is not a type of sanctification, but a type of the life of faith, a tried faith built on a real God, and Abraham believed God. If you look at all of Abraham's life, the guy screwed up. The guy sometimes did what he was told and sometimes only did part of what he was told. And it didn't work out until he went on with what he was told. Sometimes he listened and thought he understood and then tried to work it out anyways. And it didn't work. Sometimes he kind of like ignored God completely and went off on his own tangent. And then, worst of all, pimped out his wife. I mean, that doesn't sound to me like a man of faith, except that God continued to work with him. So in your life, when you look at Abraham and you realize that part of your life is going to be kind of chaotic as you're learning to walk with God, don't get caught up in this kind of religious worldly religion kind of feeling that you can get when you're just staying safe and secure in the church or some friends around. But don't be surprised if, you know, at some point in time in the future when you're alone, you start falling apart or falling away in some way you never thought you would. Because if Abraham is an example of the life of faith, then you've got something to look forward to. And that's falling away. Because when you fall away, God's still there. He doesn't say, I will leave you because you didn't follow me. No, if anything, he says, because you're willing to have given me your utmost in the beginning, I will take you to the uttermost to save you from yourself. Because that's what I do, because I live in you. You see, it's not always about what you do, but it's about what he can do in you. And that's why we call it my utmost for his highest and how he is able to save to the uttermost all those that call upon him. So when you fail and you fall, all you need to do is call upon him because he already knows and he knew ahead of time you were going to do it. So what are you worried about going back to him for? Cry out to him. Go to him. He already knew what you were going to do in the first place. Just receive the love that he has for you. And then, when he does challenge you, like Abraham, take now thy son, thy only son, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean in your own understanding anymore. In all your ways, acknowledge him. and He'll direct your path, even if it's through something that looks pretty weird on the surface. Until he brings you through it, you won't know what I'm talking about until you do it. <laughs>